Hello, please let me see your ticket subs for the Double Edge Double Bill. This week, Roger Ebert has a dog day after North. Each week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fates for the next episode. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. I'm Thomas Mariani, and sadly, I have not won a Pulitzer Prize, unlike some people. And I'm Adam Thomas, and I just got back from globetrotting, meeting a bunch of celebrity cameos, and it was awful. It was, it was just awful. Well, I'm sure none of them were horribly, like, offensive and awful, right? None of them had, like, a horrible implications to them, right? You met Kathy Bates and it was totally great. It's just awesome yep. Kathy Bates and her natural skin tone, right? Yep, 100%. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to that, everybody. But uh, welcome to the Double Edge Double Bill, in which uh, every week, Am and I cover a good and a bad pick that we picked at the end of the previous episode that's related to a topic. And uh, this week... Uh, we're doing uh, a bit of, uh, you know, an interesting topic, as it were, one that uh, I've wanted to do for quite a while on the show. Um, I wanted to do uh, sort of a tribute to Mr. Roger Ebert, who, in about 10 years ago, roughly, we were delayed a week uh, due to some other recording uh, scheduling issues uh, a few weeks ago. But um, within this month, um, uh, 10 years ago, we lost Roger Ebert. Uh, one of the great critics out there. And, uh, you know, today we're going to be covering one of his great and one of his most hated movies. And because, you know, I, Roger Ebert was a huge, huge like influence on obviously a lot of critics, but um, he was like sort of the first person I ever recognized as like a critic. And a lot of people, I guess, had that given, you know, all the stuff with him and Gene Siskel on the Siskel and Ebert show and all this other stuff. And even from like when he started writing in like 67, all the way until his last review was published like a couple days after he died in 2013. I wanted to pay tribute to this guy because he was such a big influence on me, but Adam, was uh, Ebert at all a, a figure in your life? Oh, definitely, man. I used to try to catch the show as much as I could. Um, I always liked him, uh, you know, not to say anything bad about Cisco, but I always preferred Ebert. Uh, even his hot takes, I thought, while I don't agree with some of it, obviously, he's a critic, you're not going to agree with everything he says, but... I always felt like he really like would take the time to thoroughly sort of, you know, after he'd rage out, explain why he didn't like something and, and really have make sure his point of view came across that, you know, these are why I don't like these things. Uh, yeah, no, Ebert, I, I think I'm about the same way. It's like the first time he was probably like, oh, that's what a film critic is. You know, there's been plenty others like, you know, Gene Shalit and all those guys, but it's just. It's Roger Ebert. When I think film critic, I think of Roger Ebert still to this day. Yeah, he was sort of the voice and face of that for sure. But uh, at the same time, like what I love, especially like a lot of my research for this week, quite frankly, was watching old Siskel and Ebert videos that are on YouTube. A lot of their reviews are archived. I would thoroughly recommend that from like not even the at the movies era, which is like from 86 until, you know, around the time Ebert had his tragic sort of issues with uh, his thyroid cancer. But like even earlier on, like they started doing that show to some degree with like a thing called sneak previews in the 70s. And the two of them, like their banter, I think is like, it's no question that it was like such a big influence influence that it led to even like film podcasts and like this show probably wouldn't exist to any degree if it wasn't for something like a Siskel and Ebert and especially if you all can track down just like watching those reviews it's always so interesting to see them try and fit like their both of their opinions into like about three minute stretches for each movie and particularly there's an episode from 1987 that's kind of infamous where it's the one where they reviewed Full Metal Jacket and Benji the Hunted and it's a whole thing where like they disagree on it and Siskel and Ebert, like, throughout the episode, are dogging on each other. <laughs> because Ebert liked Benji the Hunt and didn't like Full Metal Jacket. And Siskel, like, continuously berating him about that throughout the entire thing. <laughs> and it's kind of amazing that that was, like, these two people arguing about movies can be incredibly fascinating television. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I loved when they laid into each other, man. I absolutely loved it. And it happened quite frequently. 
you know, and, and plus I do want to address like if anybody hasn't seen it and you're able to, the Ebert documentary that came out. Yes, Life Itself. Not not the other one with Oscar Isaac. And a no, few no, other no, people. not that, not that one. movie. Yes, not the 2014 one. documentary. Uh, yeah. With, uh, Ebert. Yes. It's quite, quite good. Yeah, particularly you see the full relationship of him and his wife, Chaz Ebert, who is still uh-huh. like running the Roger Ebert sites. It's a beautiful relationship those two had. And um, I'm, I also just love the fact that she's kind of run his site to where like all his reviews are archived, but also she's given voices to a lot of other critics, especially of, you know, not just white male critics it's really fascinating especially when you consider like with at the movies near the end of that tenure as like roper replaced siskel obviously but then when roger wasn't on board as much you had a lot more of like the sort of like michael phillips and like some good critics but then there's that one period where it was like ben mankiewicz and ben lyons and you just see like oh these two do not have any chemistry and especially ben lyons is one of the worst possible like film critics out there who has no perception of film whatsoever it makes you appreciate that like somebody isn't just an entertaining face or like a handsome face they're also just like really interesting personalities with actual thoughts to them like ebert siskel and you know very few other critics can be yeah i completely agree i thought roper was all right yeah uh but siskel and ebert were the perfect like sort of yin and yang it's a bummer that maybe like it doesn't really exist anymore that show but at the same time Criticism has become, film criticism in particular, has become such a, like, just a vile, really shady sort of business at this point, where, you know, I sort of, I miss this era of film critics. Though at the same time, you still have places, like I mentioned, RogerEber.com, or maybe FilmCred, a site that I contribute to sometimes, uh, who has a lot of interesting critics that actually, like, give a shit about how the, what they're writing and don't, aren't, like, the vile uh, awful putrid stuff you see on, say, like a YouTube four hour video about why Star Wars is too woke. Yeah, right, exactly. Or there's this one guy, uh, he's kind of a jackass, but he writes for, it's like Mariani.wordpress. He, I don't, I, that dude stopped writing reviews a while ago. We just post this dumb podcast basically on that block at this point. Oh, that's for the best. Yeah, because even then, you know, with Ebert, I can also say, like, as horror fans, I think we can also agree that, like, he did kind of have it out for certain genres. Like, he he always at least had an appreciation for, like, I want to accept a film on its own terms, and that's why he was one of the people who was, like, really praising, say, Carpenter's Halloween, the original when it came out. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, that dude really laid into the slasher genre brutally, which I kind of get, because, like, if you're a film critic who sees everything, and you're during that age where it's, like, every other week a slasher movie comes out... I get getting tired of it, but at the same time, I don't know if I would say, like, literally list out the crew of Silent Night, Deadly Night, and just say, shame, like, which is what he and Siskel literally did. <laughs> they literally were just like, the director, shame. Producer, shame. How dare you do this? It's like, I don't know. Maybe we yeah, don't have to go much. that far with it. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. It's okay that you don't like horror films. I mean, most critics don't. Uh, but yeah, he did go a little off sometimes. For sure. Especially 80s era of horror. But at the same time, what's interesting always is it's kind of what you mentioned earlier. Like, he was sort of the first person who kind of taught me the idea of, like, one, like, you should review a film on its own terms. And two, more importantly, that, like, even if a critic isn't somebody who, like, you agree with all the time, having that constant sort of barometer where it's like, oh, Roger didn't like this horror movie. I'll probably like it because you know their taste. And you know, like, they explained their point of view so well that you're like, okay, that stuff he explained doesn't really bother me as much, so I'll go see it. Like, there's a value to that. At the same time, there's as much value to you agreeing with Roger Ebert on whatever. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, he was definitely one of those, wait, Ebert hates it? I kind of got to see it. For sure on that. And, you know, uh, what we're talking about here specifically is he would collect a lot of his reviews into the big uh, sort of, like, compilation books um, for both the movies he loved and the movies he hated the most. And we've covered, interestingly, a lot of both of those, where in, in terms of his great movies we've covered previously on the show, that includes Night of the Hunter, Bride of Frankenstein, Network, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, 25th Hour, Casablanca, Double Indemnity, Dr. Strangelove, The Conversation, The Apartment, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, The Last Picture Show, Mulholland Drive, E.T., The Seventh Seal, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, AI Artificial Intelligence, The Killing, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and With Nail and I. And, you know, we liked a lot of those. Not all of them. Some of those were bad picks. Yeah, most of them were pretty good. With, with Nail and I. Okay, sure. Right, right. And and then the contrast is on of his most hated movies. Uh, we have covered Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, Jim Cotta, Constantine, Clifford, 
Day of the Dead, uh, Halloween H2O, 20 years later, End of Days, The Postman, and Battlefield Earth. Most of those we didn't like, but, you know, there's also, like, Halloween 3 or Day of the Dead, which are movies we really like. So they can go yeah. either way, especially the horror films, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, for sure. Uh, he's pretty spot on about most of those. I don't know, Jim Cotta is pretty epic. Right, right. But now, today, we'll be covering two different ones that he had on both his great movies and most hated movies. Uh, we'll be talking about Adam's good pick, which was Dog Day Afternoon, and then my bad pick, which is North. Uh, both of those, he had a lot of interesting thoughts, and uh, we'll get into ours as we first start off with Dog Day Afternoon. You know something, people? You're going to be remembered the rest of your lives for the day you got held up and kidnapped. At approximately 3 p.m. on August 22, 1972, Sonny Wurzik and Sal Naturale entered the first Brooklyn Savings Bank and attempted a robbery. Hey, please! Nobody move! Get over there! The attempt failed. There's no money here. They picked it up this afternoon. There's only 1100 This is too much. For the people of the neighborhood, it was a sideshow. Sonny! Sonny! But for Sonny and Sal the hostages, and the cops. It was a dog day afternoon. I'm a Catholic, and I don't want to hurt anybody, you understand? All right, who, who has to go to the bathroom? Oh, Honey, come on out! Yeah! We're entertainment, right? What do you, what do you, what do you got for us? Hanukkah! Hanukkah! Al Pacino. Dog Day Afternoon. A true story. So Dog Day Afternoon came out uh, September 21st, 1975, uh, from director Sidney Lamette. Uh, written by Frank Pearson, which was based on a Life magazine article, The Boys in the Bank, uh, by P.F. Kludge and Thomas Moore, which was based on, of course, the true story uh, that involved literally a bank robbery that happened on August 22nd, 1972, in which it was uh, John Wolchowski, apologies if I fuck up these names, uh, Salvatore Natural and uh, Robert Westernberg uh, attempted to rob a branch of the Chase Manhattan Bank in Brooklyn, and uh, after they kind of had the error of like, oh, instead of the money being dropped off today, the money was actually picked up today. Um, they ended up staying in that bank for several hours and then uh, were, had a huge hostage situation happen. And this is the movie that eventually resulted from that in 1975. And Adam, this was your choice. And I'm curious uh, to hear your thoughts and why you picked it, especially because it stars Al Pacino, who is uh, a big guy that you love so much. So I'm curious, uh, why Dog Day Afternoon? I mean, kind of several reasons. One is Dog Day Afternoon is such a unique movie to, to me. I mean, like you said, early Pacino. Love Pacino, of course. Uh, you know, John Cazale. It, it's a great cast. I mean, there is just a huge cast in this movie. A lot of even guys in the background. You're like, holy, holy shit, that's Lance Henriksen. You know, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. For the time that this movie came out and the sort of subject material it's dealing with, and it's kind of amazing how they handle it. Uh, it's handled you know, if anybody's wondering what I'm talking about, there's, you know, homosexual undertones in this. And there's, you know, there's a big, like a sex change sort of idea that's happening. And and they don't really demonize it at all. Like, it, it's, you know, there are some of the cops are kind of, you know, the way they treat Chris Sarandon and things like that. But it's handled so well and so, like, just not mean-spirited. And it's just kind of a weird, darkly funny movie, too. Like, there's a lot of funny bits to this movie and it just kind of becomes this really unique movie the, you know there's heist movies i've seen a ton of heist movies i love a good heist movie uh and this is that in a way but it, it, the other way it's just this really interesting character study and also you know the idea of you know veterans and how they're treated and sort of big banking against the little man and it's just it's such a unique thing that ah, there's no other movie that exists like this. And, uh, you know, when I went back and did all my early Pacino watches, this one definitely stood out. And I was like, I got to talk about this. I, I like it's, it was one of those movies that I heard about forever that I just never really got around to watching, uh, for some reason or another. And finally, when I watched it before it started it, I'm like, well, is this going to hold up or is it just a classic of the time? You know, or no, this is absolutely like still just a fucking basically a perfect film. Like it's it's on par with the great classics of all time. You know, even Pacino's great classics or the other movies John Cazale was in. I mean, it holds up with those 
toe to toe. It's just kind of a masterpiece. Yeah, that was something I remember when I first saw this in high school. I was kind of worried about like, oh, is this going to hold up quite as well? Is there just something that's been kind of overhyped to me? And I thought the same thing after I finished it back then as I did when I finished it now, rewatching it before this particular episode for the first time in so long. Uh, I realized, I'm like, no, this is one of the great, especially movies of this particular period, this kind of like new Hollywood age that we kind of referenced before, where you have, you know, your Francis Ford Coppola, speaking of Pacino, you know, Scorsese, all these other people uh, coming up. At the same time, like, this movie, I think, just stands apart. I think it's it's mainly because, like, you mentioned the heist element of it. What I love with this is, like, in a usual heist movie, things go wrong by the end of Act 2, as opposed to this is a heist movie where things go wrong after, like, the end of Minute 2. Oh, it's right away. Right, because, like, these two, uh, where you got, like, uh, Pacino and Cazale, who are going into this bank heist, and initially things are a bit tense and you're a bit worried, uh, but the moment they just are, like, especially the moment that Pacino pulls out his gun... And it fucks up to where, like, he tries to pull it out and, like, the one part of the bow gets stuck on the gun. He starts, like, throwing it around and shit like that. Like, that all comes from just, like, the naturalism Sidney Lumet really wanted to, like, engross this movie in because it's based on these real events. And even though, like, not all of the moments, like, are beat to beat exactly what happened in real life, that realism immediately gets you just into the situation where you feel like you're in that bank with all those people. Or at the same time, when you cut over to, like, Charles Durning and the cops and stuff that you feel like you're on the outside of that and you're just immediately just sucked into the entire sort of like uh, sweltering heat of this movie. That's another thing. A perfect depiction of like a summer August sort of uh, time period in terms of everyone is tired and sweaty and they feel like shit, especially by the end of this, like the sweat pouring off of everybody by like the time they start getting people out of the bank is so authentic in a way where it feels just like, yeah, I can feel the lack of air conditioning in that bank. Oh, yeah, it's hot. It's, st- you know, you know, it's starting to get smelly. Uh, everybody's sweating. And, you know, and you said it best. It, it's pretty much right away. Like as, as soon as John Cazale's in there and told me to watch this really good little 40 minute documentary about him. And it, it's kind of spot on where he's so different looking. And he's, you know, with the hair and the hairline and it's kind of long and he's so skinny and intimidating. But you kind of just get the opinion right away. Like, this is not going to go well. (laughs) Like, like, he's too unpredictable right off the bat. And then, like you said, Pacino just, he's a bad guy. I mean, he's trying to rob a bank, but you still kind of get the feeling like he doesn't really want to be doing this. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. He does, But it's like means to the end and it's just, or ends to the means. And it's just it's kind of a, a full study of whatever can go wrong is going to go wrong. And it pretty much does the entire movie. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that. Uh, I just want to shout out that documentary. Um, I knew it was you, which is about John Cazale, who, if you don't know, is this guy who was in um, the first two Godfather movies, this movie, the conversation, which we've covered previously, as I mentioned, and the deer hunter, and then tragically died very young at like age 40 three or so. Um, and that little documentary, it's only 40 minutes long. Um, and it does give you, I think there's a great, um, line from Mark Harris, another great critic out there, um, who says in that documentary about like so many other people who, when they portray like men who are quote unquote weak, um, they always want to make it seem like it's an, a performance so that it's like, Oh, I'm not actually weak. I, they had like that ego about them. Whereas Cazale had no interest in doing that, and he was so very just, like, natural in playing that character. And even, like, Pacino talks in that documentary about how, like, oh, you know, the improvisation on that, we would just be, like, kind of talking. We didn't know the scene sort of started. At least I didn't know. And thus I got kind of got into this character. So it just feels like you are naturally in the situation with those two, with particularly, like, a line that he improvised. The whole thing about, like, hey, what country would you want to go to if you wanted to leave? Just, like, Wyoming. (laughs) Like, perfectly displays that um, that character, the Sal character, is an idiot. But at the same time, it just gives you a full nuanced take of, like, oh, this guy doesn't have an education. He doesn't have any perception of what the world is outside of, like, New York, where he's been living for so long. And just the idea of, like, oh, let's leave to Wyoming as a different country tells you everything about that guy's past before he got into this bank. That's some of the dark, funny comedy bits in this movie. Like, there's a couple of them, you know, when Pacino, like... They're calling each other's name. They're looking around the pole, that classic bit. You know, they don't see each other. They don't see each other. And then the bit with him, you shouldn't poison your body bit and all that stuff about smoking, which unfortunately is very awful in context when you think about what actually happened. But still, it's Mm -hmm. just, there's these just 
bits to this movie that I just I laugh at, and then I get sad and emotional and cry at parts of this movie. And it's one of those where it works so well. You know, if a movie can take characters like these two, these bank robbers and these criminals, and by the end you you really want them to get away, and they're not good people, like they're really not. Uh, but you just kind of hope they make it. And for that's not a real easy thing to do. I mean, you do see it happen a lot when it's like the cool slick guy criminals, like, you know, the geckos and from dust till dawn or something like that, where it's like, they're so cool. Oh, I hope they were fucking awful natural born killers. But or, or quite... speaking of, you know, George Clooney, like in Ocean's Eleven, like Danny Ocean's yeah. a piece of shit, but you're like, God damn it. He's so cool. I, can't, I right. want him to keep going. Right. Exactly. And the, but the, the, the story is catered for that. Like they, it's, that's on purpose. Like that's manufactured. They know what they're doing. This one, it just feels all sort of kind of, it comes naturally, like just through these guys and the performances and what the, what the goal here is and all that. Like it, you end up sympathizing with them, uh, especially the Pacino character by the end of it, where you're like, you really want him to get away. You really hope this goes well for him. And uh, for a story to just sort of do that organically, I mean, it's not an easy thing to accomplish, but I think this one absolutely accomplishes that in spades. Well, I think it does also help by the fact that as much as I do agree, I think Kazale and Pacino are amazing in this movie. Everyone kind of is, like particularly like even everybody in the bank is so good. Like all the tellers, including young Carol Kane, who I completely forgot was in this movie. Like, oh shit, there she is. Um, but they're all so good at especially kind of getting you this weird investment too, where they're so terrified initially. And then as they kind of like adjust to the reality of like, okay, this is the situation we're in, but they, these guys aren't violent. They have no interest in hurting us. They're all kind of like chilling. I love that one, like sort of big panning shot where like, there's the one who's kind of like trying to use the gun to like do like the military moves that Pacino's trying to teach her. And everyone else is kind of like smoking and chilling out around the desk and stuff like that. Particularly my favorite is Penelope Allen who plays uh, the one Sylvia, who they kind of call Mouth in the movie. Um, I, I love, like, her, where she just feels like she's, like, a middle-aged woman who just is, like, working this bank job and kind of hates it, and then this happens, like, oh, fuck, guys, come on, like, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> and we're doing, and especially the bit where they uh, try and get the one, uh, the guard who has asthma out, and the cops immediately storm on him. And she's like, what the hell? He's a hostage. What's wrong with you? What are you doing? It immediately gets you that kind of investment where, like, even the cops aren't, like, the good guys. They're just the guys who have to get them out of the situation because legally they're the only ones who can, basically. Like, no one's necessarily a fully good or bad guy. It just feels just like these, all of them are kind of, like, human and have foibles to some degree. Like, particularly, like, all the scenes with Pacino and Durning when they're arguing early on and you can hear Durning, like, fuck up like the lines where he's talking about like, Oh, Oh, so was this all an elaborate thing? Yes. No, no, that's not what this is. <laughs> like he's fucking it up as he's saying it, like immediately immerses you in the reality of this movie. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Every character in it is fully formed for the most part. I mean, of course, like, yeah, you got the background cops and you know, the bank manager and all that stuff, but still every character feels real in this environment. It feels like an absolutely, uh, real situation, real environment that's happening. These people populate this world. Even down to, like, that fucking pizza guy. That's one of my favorite moments of the movie when that pizza Me guy too. comes up. And he does, like, the elaborate thing where Pacino's trying to pay him and all this other stuff. And then there's a pause after Pacino leaves and he's like, I'm a fucking star! And then the crowd cheers for him. Just immediately kind of gets you into this. And it, it, it's interesting where uh, Ebert kind of talked about this, where this movie feels like it's very much in the zeitgeist of that time. Where This is a quote from his review from 1975, where he says, quote, Criminals become celebrities because their crimes provide fodder for the media. Many of the fashionable new crimes hijacking, taking hostages, are committed primarily as publicity stunts. And a complex relationship grows among the criminals, their victims, the police, and the press. Knowing they're on TV, hostages comb their hair, and killers say uh, the things that they've learned on the evening news. That's the subject, in a way, of Sidney Lumet's pointed film. And I think that's spot on. And it feels very, especially like this movie, feels kind of ahead of its time, but also sadly still very prescient where whenever these things are presented on the news, there is an immediate relationship that forms between an audience watching the news and those criminals, whether it be negative or somewhat positive. Yeah, for sure. Uh, can I ask, now, he's quite good in it, but do you think Sarandon should have got the nom over Kazali? 
Um, well, yeah, Chris Sarandon, who plays um, Leon, who is at least how this character is referred to in the movie, the lover of um, the Al Pacino character. I think the thing is, with, with that character, it, it's kind of like you said earlier, like, the, the the it's so hard to make that particular role, especially in this time period, not feel like a sadistic joke. And I think a lot of that is obviously due to, like, Lamette's direction, but so much of it's also on Sarandon's performance. And I think it's a limited performance, because we only see about, like, ten minutes of him. Mm-hmm. But it's such a great fucking impact. Like, the whole this conversation initially with Charles Durning, where, like, you, you get immediately, like, this person is queer, but at the same time is not treated as a stereotype. It's just treated as, you know, someone who is living in this particular era of New York and is constantly berated, I'm sure, in their real life. And then this situation happens on top of it. And they can't really, like, handle that emotionally in a way that anybody would be empathetic toward. Anyone who, you know, has a soul out there would be empathetic toward. And then the phone conversation with Pacino, even despite the fact that obviously they're not in the same room delivering these lines, you immediately get the sense that that feels like a natural actual phone conversation and i think despite that it's a smaller amount of time compared to you know kazale i think that nomination is completely deserved i think it's a beautiful performance from sarandon and especially for his first film performance it's amazing yeah that's true i didn't i never i always forget to take that into account uh no i agree i think it's a great performance i mean maybe not take away his nomination but i i honestly think kazale should have been nominated as well um because he's He's so fucking good in this. Like, I, I love him, of course, as Fredo. Uh, I think him as Fredo in Godfather 2 is probably his best work. Uh, but this is right up there. I mean, this is just such a unnerving, creepy, but darkly funny performance. It, it's just kind of, uh, you know, fantastic. I mean, the thing is, him and Pacino together, like, man, they brought out the best in each other, for sure. I mean, it's some of the best, like chemistry between two actors ever between these two in both the Godfather movies and, and then this it's just yeah I wish he would have got maybe got recognized too it's kind of amazing that out of the five movies he's in uh, there's been there was 40 nominations and he was never nominated for anything for best supporting it's kind of a bummer really uh, I think he absolutely deserved it I mean of course you know, he died at 42 years old and, it, like, the work that we could have got on. But the the one we do have, the five roles, I mean, he's just incredible. So I, I do wish he maybe would have got the nom as well. Uh, obviously, Pacino did and well-deserved, but it's such a riveting performance. I mean, the whole movie is riveting. The whole movie, like, you're on edge, but you're, like, on a relaxed edge. Like, you're just kind of enjoying it, but you know at any second thing, something's going to go wrong. But, uh, yeah, and I just think it's because of sort of Gazzali's and Pacino's performances in particular that, that sort of keeps you teetering. Uh, so I just kind of, like I said, I kind of wish he maybe would have got a little bit more cred for it. Well, yeah, especially, I'll, I'll just say this, considering the nominees for Best Supporting Actor that year, besides Sarandon, were uh, Burgess Meredith for The Day of the Locust, Brad Dorff for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Jack Warden for Shampoo, and then the winner was George Burns for The Sunshine Boys. Uh, you could have slipped in, Gazelle, instead of maybe... George Burns. I don't know. That was clearly like a yeah. one, which is like he might die as opposed to like not realizing he's going to live for another like what thirty five years yeah, after the point. Like that. Yeah, <laughs> right. For sure. Yeah. Uh, but but no. Yeah, I, I think he should have especially slotted in maybe over you know Burns necessarily. But at the same time, I think it's a weird thing where this whole cast, like I said, is so talented and so immerses you in this, and also Lamette's direction does. Like to talk about Lamette's direction, I love like one. There's not any soundtrack besides the uh, Elton John Amarina song at the beginning, which is a great montage. One of the better examples in, like, so many movies have tried to do, like, the, oh, the montage setting up what New York is like. And this is, I would argue, one of the few that gets it so pitch perfectly. Um, but then, after that, no score, just natural sound all over the place. An amazing, like, sound mix on this movie as well, where every single, like, ruffling and awkward step has a nat- very natural sound to it. But then, one of my favorite sort of examples of great editing in this movie, where there's the bit where Pacino accidentally shoots out the window in the back, and you suddenly cut to every single angle of everyone reacting to that shot just immediately, once again, immerses you, not just in the bank, but also just around every single corner, which is like, everyone is on fucking edge. And you have to try and, like, scramble when something horrible like that happens. It, I, I think it does such a great job. This, so much of this is so incredible with it. I know the only award it won was for the screenplay 
which is admittedly a great screenplay that like fully uh, like gets you invested in all these characters. But at the same time, like every single element of this movie feels like so stellar that like I would it's it's one of those movies where it's like awarded to all of them, award every single thing. Yeah, I agree. You know, like I said at the top of the show, this is one of those movies where I don't really throw it around as often as some people might. Um, but this is to me just. A perfect movie like it's perfectly constructed it's perfectly shot it's perfectly edited it's perfectly acted it's perfectly paced it's a masterpiece that you know if people do know this movie it's not like it's one that people don't uh give it the credit it sort of deserves or whatever but i don't think it's it's necessarily in sort of the pop culture zeitgeist as much as it might deserve to be uh it's just it's kind of just fascinating that this didn't really catch on as much as sort of like Maybe not The Godfather, but again, Masterpiece. But uh, this, th- I think this deserves a spot right up there. I think it's one of those things where it's like, it's partially because it's not nearly as flashy. With The Godfathers, which I love those movies, they are big Hollywood movies, as opposed to Lament, who was a guy who, like, we talked about Network on the show, and he's a guy who made a million movies, and so many of them are great. But at the same time, that dude was never somebody who had, like, a very flashy style. He was sort of like a workman director, but... The great thing about his direction was that he he made, like, not having a specific style his style, where he feels sort of like the chameleon of directors in terms of, like, I can immediately put you in, like, any situation that is given to me, and I can immediately immerse you. For the most part, you know, sometimes you have your The Wizzes, which was shortly after this, which was not a great <laughs> use of his talents necessarily. Um, but I think it just shows, like, that's him trying to make, like, a big-budget Hollywood movie and just failing spectacularly at it. As opposed to, like, this has none of that flash, none of that over-the-top pizzazz, and I think is all the better for that. Like, even, I love the fact that he apparently had Pacino do, like, the phone conversation he has where he has it, uh, the one with Sarandon and then the one with his act- with his uh, wife, his first wife, um, and they like go back and forth. Pacino's side was like shot as one consistent take, and then like at the end of that first take, which he said was great, he's like, "Okay, Al, we're gonna go again." And that exhaustion on his face feels so authentic because he's like, "I've been here since like two, doing so much shooting, and I did this amazing take of this particular like really hard scene, and now I have to do it again." And they use that second take. Because that's what feels like the most authentic and, like, not sexy at all. Like, despite the fact that Pacino was, like, at this time, like, a very appealing-looking guy, he is, like, so sapped of any of, like, that kind of potential sexuality that's in him. He is, like, so, like, just exhausted and dead inside and just like, I I don't know I can keep fucking going. <laughs> and that lack of flash, I think, is the main reason it doesn't, like, have a huge cultural legacy. But at the same time, I think it's what makes it an amazing movie. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you're 100% accurate on that. I, uh, you know, you, I don't say that often either. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's probably the reason why I love it so much is because it's not flashy and it's not so in your face and bombastic with a score and there's no big crazy action scenes. I mean, there's a couple action beats, but none of it's real, you know, shootout, car chase. None it doesn't really happen. And when the action sort of beats do happen it's it's sort of just matter of factly done Kazale's death i think is a great example of that yeah or if you got like a tony scott to do it it would be you know really fun entertaining but it wouldn't be as fucking brutal as it is that like you see henrickson reaching for the gun and then you see just like him remind Kazale about like remember what i said keep your gun up and then turns around shoots him in the head just it's done everybody starts piling out and it's all over it just immediately like deflates you from the amount, massive amount of tension that whole car ride has, and uh, then even when you see like after that, Pacino just sort of like he's being arrested. He knows like his life's done. He's not going to be able to help any of the people that he wanted to help with this particular bank heist. But he looks over at the hostages, just like at least they seem like they're they're going to get out of it. You know, that's something. And he's just like kind of there, kind of dazed to himself, at least appreciating one thing about this horrible outcome that he never would have wanted. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, so uh, we have another movie to talk about um, oh, and fuck. have not nearly as much glowing praise toward. So any brief, like, final thoughts about Dog Day Afternoon, Adam? Uh, like I said, I think it's just a perfect film, man. It, it's one of those, like, if you haven't seen it, if anybody listening to this, all three of you or however many. There are dozens of them. Dozens? <laughs> well, you dozens. Uh, or it's three people listening to it. Over and over, a dozen which, times. <laughs> yep. God, why? Um, but um, <laughs> if you guys haven't seen this, I mean, this is one that like stop 
stop what you're doing and watch it. Uh, it's a perfect film. It's a classic for a fucking reason. Like Ebert was spot on, but you know, with loving this movie, it, it's just. It's so great, and it's one of those like if like I said, if you haven't seen it, and you you're into like sort of classic cinema or cinema of the '70s or movies that are considered American classics, and this one somehow passed you by. Or if you only know Al Pacino as like that guy who dances with his headphones that have a Shrek case on the phone, <laughs> like that's Which is great. By the way, <laughs> it's but... amazing. I'm not denying that, but <laughs> yeah. he was a lot of things before that point. There was a lot. See what led to that point here. We're just thinking this whole time, like, oh man, I'd love to have a Shrek phone case on my cell phone mm-hmm. that will totally exist in 45 years. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, if you haven't, or yeah, like you said, if even if you. Uh, or a Pacino fan, and this one passed you by. I mean, watch it. You're not going to regret it. You're not going to have a bad time with it. Uh, you're going to understand why it gets the praise that it does when it does. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think this is also, I would agree with you, it's one of those rare examples of, like, a 5 out of 5 movie it is perfect on its own terms, as, like, an Ebert would say. Um, and I think even with, like, you know, some stuff, if you're kind of afraid about, like, oh, is this, you know, some of the stuff about the, the queer elements going to, like, turn you off and we're too cis- guys one bisexual one not uh talking about this um at the same time what i like about it is like we both agree that like it's not treated at all as like a joke or insensitively but at the same time any of the stuff that feels kind of dated about like you know pronouns and stuff like that with the chris sarandon character all feels just like very firmly dated in this particular time where the movie explicitly states it takes place august 22nd 1972 it was like this is just of the era what a bunch of especially like straight people around these people kind of perceive them to be like there's that really wonderful moment where um because they all talks about like oh they're calling me a homosexual they're saying two homosexuals are pulling up on holding up this bank i'm not a homosexual you're gonna tell them that's like whatever it's what it, they're gonna say it's what they think they're seeing out here and i think that's a great way of like just establishing so much of what this movie is which is like the perspective of like a desperate situation that's being watched by hundreds of like millions of people all around the world at one time and that kind of like that giddiness that sort of there's an excitement but there's also like a tension there's like confusion also from so many different people like we haven't even talked about like the mom character or his first wife who i think are actually very well handled in terms of just like that desperation in their voices as they're talking to him and why at the same time you can see why he has like all this bit built up pressure about just like who he should supposedly be and he's like oh my god i can't handle this like it does such a great job of establishing every single perspective really well despite us saying very firmly with like either the cops on the one side or with uh, Pacino and Cazale and that those bank tellers on the other side I think he does such a great job of firmly establishing like these people aren't are imperfect they are human and they have all these massive problems and not nobody's necessarily 100% right or wrong but uh, at the same time uh, everything just kind of goes down in a blaze of sweat and sadness and terror in the only like a way that like those seventies movies can really portray those seventies American New Hollywood movies can do such a great job of. But now we're gonna be talking about North. Ask me about yeah. jeans, please. I grew up on jeans. Yeah. From Rob Reiner Pants, that's comes a new know. comedy about a kid named <laughs> North. The one thing that we cannot control in this life is who our parents are. You felt the hand, you stuck with it. You need new parents and you need them now. You got a lawyer? Let's get cracking. I rule in favor of the plaintiff. Yes! yes! If there was an Egypt land, let my all people all go free. Hey, that's a court of law! <laughs> However, if he is not physically in the arms of either his new parents or his original parents by noon on Labor Day, he will be remanded to an orphanage. <laughs> Who are you? I'm North. See your name on maps. Very impressive. Elijah Wood, Dan Aykroyd, Reba McIntyre, Kathy Bates, Graham Greene, Alan Arkin, Kelly McGillis, Alexander Goodenow, John Lovitz, Bruce Willis, Bruce Willis, and Bruce Willis. What are you? Some kind of guardian angel? An Easter Bunny. North. So, North came out July 22nd, 1994, from director Rob Reiner, uh, and was written by Andrew Scheinman and Alan Zweibel, uh, based on his children's novel, North, uh, that has a dumb, long title, I'm not going to say. Um, and this movie, 
I only really knew of because of the Roger Ebert review. This was one of the infamous examples of, like, the sort of power that Ebert had, where this movie was not going to be successful either way, but his review, I think, really firmly cemented it wouldn't be. Um, he ma- said that this film was his worst film of 1994, and also one of the worst films he'd ever seen. And this is from his review, uh, quote, I hated this movie. Hated, 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 hated this movie. Hated it. Hated every simpering, stupid, vacant, audience-insulting moment of it. Hated the sensibility that thought anyone would like it. Hated the implied insult to the audience by its belief that anyone would be entertained by it. Which, that would later become the uh, title of one of his bad review compilations called I Hated, Hated, Hated This Movie. And he would later go on, when he was on Siskel and Ebert talking about it, he said this as well, quote, um, I hated this movie as much as any movie we have ever reviewed in the 19 years we've been doing this show. I hate it because of the premise, which seems shockingly cold-hearted, and because this premise is being suggested to kids as children's entertainment, because everybody in the movie was vulgar and stupid, and because the jokes weren't funny, and because most of the characters were obnoxious, and because of the phony attempt to add a little pseudo-hip philosophy with the Bruce Willis character. And you know, Adam... Uh, hot take, uh, he's spot on, because uh, having seen this movie now, uh, I agree, I hated, hated, hated this movie. <laughs> it's really fucking terrible. <laughs> it's absolutely fucking awful. Uh, I saw this not too long after it came out. I, you know, it was probably rented for us or whatever, because it was a kid's movie, and I hated it then. I finished it this morning. Uh, I tried to watch it over a couple days, just because I had my kid and stuff. And uh, it's fucking terrible. I mean, it is so fucking bad. There's not a likable person in the in the movie. Uh, it is really problematically casted in certain parts. Kathy Bates, I'm looking at you in particular. Uh, not necessarily your fault, but still, oh boy. Also, Abe Vigoda, also Richard Belzer, also a lot of other people, quite frankly, in this movie. Yeah, that's true, especially in that sequence. Um, but yeah, it's just... I mean, what the fuck is this movie? What the fuck are we supposed to... Uh, like... And the kid... It, oh, God. It's just... it's I, I oh, It, like, breaks well, my brain, this movie. I should probably the, at least give a brief plot synopsis, because I'm sure most people are not aware of this movie who aren't aware of the Ebert thing about it. Just give you a basic um, sort of plot setup here, where um, North is uh, the titular character, played by Elijah Wood during peak sort of kid Elijah Wood days. Um, and he is this kid who's apparently extremely great at, like, his, you know, his grades, he acts in school plays, he's part of the baseball team, everyone loves him, but he feels that he's not appreciated by his parents, uh, who are played by Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Jason Alexander. Isn't this around the time, like, Seinfeld started, I guess? Was, like, 94, right? It had been on for, like, a year or two at this point. Right, right. But uh, George and Elaine have raised, basically, this child, uh, North, and he feels like he's not appreciated by his parents. So then uh, he comes up with the idea, eventually, after having a conversation with a mall Easter bunny, played by Bruce Willis, who pops up throughout the movie in various different roles. Um, so I'm like, well, you can't pick your parents, kid. I, that's unfortunate. He basically comes up with the idea of, like, oh, I should emancipate myself. And that starts a rip-roaring journey where he is... Um, put on the spot by the judge, uh, played by Alan Arkin, to try and find new parents uh, from the start of the summer. He's like, it's July 1st of the summer until Labor Day. He has to find either new parents or to go back to his old parents. And if he doesn't do either of those things, he'll have to go to an orphanage. And so it's an odyssey in which he goes to various different potential parents to try and find new ones. Now, on paper, that sounds like it could be maybe kind of a fun kids movie, maybe if you did it in a certain way. Uh, The way they decided to do it was to have uh, the North character go through of these different uh, parental relationships, and all of them are incredible, like, stereotypes that are either incredibly offensive or just unfunny. They're all unfunny, but um, there's also the added layer of some of these are extremely offensive, as we'll get into. But I think even the weird thing is, like, from the jump, that silly premise... Like, that happens about 20 minutes into the movie or so when that kicks off. It doesn't feel like it's that sort of, like, different and bizarre from, like, the earlier part of the movie. Which is key when you find out, like, all the stuff once he starts to try and emancipate himself is all a dream. Spoilers. It's all a dream at the end of the movie. And with that knowledge at the end of the movie, there's obviously, like, the dramatic dissatisfaction with it. Where it's like, oh, this is all a dream or whatever. But also, more crucially, if this was all a dream and this was all in North's head... 
I fucking hate North even more than I did at the start of this movie, because this kid is a horrible person who shouldn't have any parents. He's awful. Fuck that kid. Oh, he's a little fuck, isn't he? He's just a little piece of shit. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, and I, you know, watching it this time, I ask, I actually forgot that it was, you know, oh, it was all a dream sequence. But then it's like, it does the even more insulting thing where it's like, oh, he's got that coin, though. Maybe this is magic. Uh, it's just, it's so fucking dumb. And it's not, none of it's earned. None of, like I said, there's not a likable character in this. Like fucking John Lovitz, like, oh God. And the little kid, like the main bad guy is, you know, I'm not trying to shit on a nine-year-old kid's act. I'm really, really not. What I will do is shit on a director who chose this kid to basically be the main foil of the movie and the kid can't deliver. And keep in mind, this is Rob Reiner, who had, about eight years earlier had done Stand By Me, a movie right, with great exactly. kid performances. A hundred, right, some of the best ever. Yeah, so it's like, what are we doing with this kid here? Like, he's just, he can't read a line, he can't do anything. And again, I'm not blaming the kid, he's a child. But you're telling me you couldn't figure something else out here. I mean, and even by, like, Elijah Wood had proven himself to be a really good child actor around this time. He's also terrible in the movie. He's, like, overacting and being, like, yeah. silly in yeah. a way that doesn't work. And, in fact, a lot of townspeople are in this movie, even, like, Dan Aykroyd, Reba McIntyre, uh, Kathy Bates, as we mentioned previously, uh, John Ritter, baby Scarlett Johansson shows up in this movie, I believe, in her film debut <laughs> as well. Like, there are a lot of talented people in this movie, and none of them are funny. And I think it's just, it, it's a weird thing where another big factor of this movie was we mentioned Rob Reiner. Like, the big thing was that this was after Rob Reiner had done the amazing run of doing This is Spinal Tap, Stand By Me, uh, the Princess Bride, A Few Good Men, Misery, When Harry Met Sally, a lot of these great, amazing movies in a row. And it's like, oh, this guy can't be beat. And then this was the movie that killed it, like, entirely. Because after this point, there's only, like, The American President right after this, which is a cute movie, and then a bunch of things you've never fucking heard of or you remember as terrible, like The Bucket List. Like, this is the movie that, like, killed that amazing miracle run of great movies. I, I guess working with this material, I could get it. Because Alan Zweibold is a guy who, like, he wrote for, like, the initial run of Saturday Night Live, like, the 70s era Saturday Night Live. And I guess that stuff, like, that sort of humor could work in small sketches on Saturday Night Live. But when you watch it over the course of this movie, it's just, like, it's so constantly, like, frustrating and annoying and not a single laugh. This is a rare movie where I'll usually point out, like, funny moments. I can't point to one. I can point to only dumb things, like when Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Jason Alexander find out that North has decided to emancipate himself. They literally, like, fall over under a, a coma, and then they're brought into the courtroom on a slab, still in their coma. And when Alan Arkin asks, like, what about the defense? And their lawyer's like, Your Honor, the defense rests. That's the fucking joke. Yep. It's bad. <laughs> it's so bad. And, yep, and everything they have Alan Arkin say is so dumb and so not funny. Uh, no, I completely agree with you. This is not one laugh throughout the whole movie. Uh, there's no chuckle. There's no, like, okay, well, this was kind of cute. Or, oh, you know what? I see what they were going for. Uh, no, it's just, it's so ridiculously dumb. Like, I get why this works as a book. Like, I can understand that. Reading a book and and sort of, you know, as a young kid or 10, 11 years old reading this, having a fun time with maybe the whimsy of it or whatever. Absolutely did not transfer to the screen whatsoever. Like you said, there's no laughs to be had. There's no likable characters. The the different parents that you meet, I mean, let's just run them down real quick. So you got Texas, which is Dan Aykroyd and Reba McIntyre. Then he goes from Texas to, I believe, Hawaii, which I forget the, the lead actor's name there, the dad. You've seen him in 8 million things, though. Uh, um, it's uh, Keon Young and Lauren Tom. Lauren Tom, who's also a prolific voice actress, Amy Wong on uh, Futurama, amongst other things. Yes, right, right, right. Uh, so there, and then the whole idea of the take on that sun uh, sun block ad, where it's the dog pulling down his pants, and you're like, this is fucking dumb. And then I think from there it's to Alaska. Yeah. And you got Kathy Bates playing, oh, God. An Inuit. Character. Playing an Inuit. Abe Vigoda playing an Inuit character. Uh, it's just, 
it's so dumb. And then from there, it's a quick stop in Amish country. Ha 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 ha. And then I believe then it's John Ritter. Well, there's also there's that insulting montage that also happens where like he goes to China. And there's all this oh, other shit. Oh, right. There's like, stuff in Africa. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Stuff in Africa, oh, yeah, as well, where God. he sees a woman who's like in, in very like offensive, like stereotypical, like uh, tribe sort of look. He's like, oh, I can't focus on my homework with topless women going around. Like this is, it's all this stuff where it's like you mentioned that whimsy angle of, it, and the movie's trying to go for like a sort of '90s era kids movie whimsy. Like the opening credits are all like all the toys in Norse room, mm-hmm. and it's all like very silly, whimsical. Mark Shaman's score sounds like very like, oh, we're going to a magical land. And all the humor is so incredibly cynical and awful and just hates humanity and hates you for watching it. <laughs> and it's just like, that that's the thing where it's like, if your movie has unlikable characters and is cynical, that can be funny. But also don't try and put a whimsy sheen on it, which is like, oh, the true nature of this was North just had to like, realize that his parents love him after getting attemptedly assassinated by an Italian stereotype guy who's like the bodyguard for <laughs> that fucking kid character who... Throughout this whole thing, there's also the bad villain character where he goes from, like, I'm on, on the school newspaper to I've become, like, Donald Trump for kids. Like, how'd that happen? What's the... What the fuck is this? I know, and you're just supposed to accept it and go with it. Because it's North's dream, therefore, that makes up for any logical inconsistencies. Or, more importantly, me suffering through all the bad fucking jokes with, like, him and John Love is just talking about. Like, oh, we're gonna make sure the kids all, like, force their parents to vote. For uh, your guy, and that's the weird thing too. Where like that's supposed to be like the big thing is like, oh, he's in- like this kid's inspiring like a kid rebellion based on what North's been doing. But they kind of drop that after a certain point, and until North ends up like trying to meet his parents again, it's like, oh fuck, we gotta kill him so that like we can still have kids rule and adults drool. I guess pretty much. Um, it- it's just it's not good. Um, <laughs> like it's- there's nothing in this that works. You know, even the Bruce Willis stuff, it's like, how bored is Bruce Willis in this movie? Like, he's just doing the same character. And then the, where they basically do the King of Comedy bit, you're like, go oh, fuck yourself, uh, where he's even wearing the same suit. Well, I mean, the worst thing is really, like, after that one, like, after he drops off North, and then he, North tries to, like, leave the airport and go to his parents' house, and he's picked up by Bruce Willis in a Federal Express truck. And they just do a Federal Express commercial where it's like, oh, we can get all your packages here. That's way more insulting to me, where it's like, fuck you for putting an ad here (laughs) near the end of this fucking movie. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. And it's, I mean, it's kind of all over the movie, too. Like, even when he goes to the John Rose house, the kid, do you like to play Nintendo? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Like, the mom's barbecuing hot dogs, and there's a big thing of French's mustard right in screen, basically. One thing that I've talked about on here a lot. You know, it's like movies like Oogie Loves or even Country Bears or things like that. It's insulting to children's intelligence. Like, truly. You know, it treats its audience like they're idiots and like the kids are idiots. They'll like it just because it's a movie with kids in it. No, it's not. It's it's a soulless piece of shit. Like, there's nothing about this movie that, like I said, book, maybe. Sure, I could see it working. I, I doubt it does, but I could understand if, you know, it's got a little bit of a fan base. But there's nothing in this movie for kids adults parents with their kids at the theater or anybody to sort of latch on to uh it's just one unfunny set piece to the next uh with a barely really kind of insulting bridging story happening what the fuck was rob reiner thinking like you said he had that brilliant fucking run man and then i completely agree this was like it this killed him and it was a massive fucking flop too which good yeah and everyone hated it much like roger did everybody fucking hated it and it's but it's also if it wasn't for sort of the roger ebert of it all i don't think this movie would even be remembered at all no i would agree with that as well yeah i mean to the point to where you know my roommate is the same age i am and he came in he's like what are you watching i'm like north he's like what the hell is that and i had to tell him what the movie's about he's like oh never heard of it you know it's like nobody knows what this is and thankfully that's the case because it's shit. It's really, it's like you mentioned earlier, the whole thing that, like, Ebert even talked about in that section of his review I quoted, where it's like, 
it feels like it's just like this movie that's insulting the audience, even the children. Cause like when I talked about, I referenced like a while ago, like the Benji, the haunted review he did, he right. talked about the fact that it's just like we, you, Gene, you know that like, we're supposed to like see these movies on like their own terms and on their own terms, like a Benji, the hunted, I preferred on its own terms compared to say a full metal jacket versus like, this is a movie where like he on the terms of like, Oh, this is supposed to be for kids. Like people say that thing all the time. Like whatever it's for kids. It's fine. It doesn't have to be the greatest movie ever made. True, but also it doesn't have to be this massively insulting movie that, like, to completely looks down like what a kid would like. Like, this feels like it's trying to kind of appeal to that zeitgeist in that 90s era for, like, kids with, like, Nickelodeon. Where it's like, yeah, kids rule, adults drool, only on Nickelodeon everybody's, like, you know, going crazy. Like, we should rule over the parents, we're the kids in America, all that kind of shit. And it feels like it's doing the very limited amount of any kind of work for that premise. Because it's just like, this kid doesn't rule. North, who's this kid who's like, oh, I'm so great at everything, but my parents don't appreciate me. Like, any kid who's around North would be just like, that kid's an asshole. I hate that kid. <laughs> he thinks he's so great. Fuck off, kid. You make all of us look bad. All our parents would really judge us based on you. There's a whole montage where it's like, oh, you know what? North brushed his teeth before bed. Oh, uh, you know what? North would eat that vegetable. All this other shit. Everyone would rightly hate this child <laughs> for being so goody two shoes and so annoying that everyone has to like live up to his example in parents' eyes. Fuck that kid. And fuck this movie for thinking that kids would like him. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I completely agree with you. God, I fucking hate it so much, you know. And it's just, like I said, the Bruce Willis thing, it's just, it's insulting. It's insulting. Oh, he woke up from a dream. Well, I'll take you home. Oh, he still got the coin. Oh, wait, he's still saying things that he said to him during his dream. Was it a dream? What is this? And then it's like the scene where he's, you know, when you first sort of meet his parents and they're sitting at the dinner or they're not paying attention well and he has a panic attack. And all this stuff, which, fuck you. But then, oh, my parents aren't listening to every word I say. <laughs> yeah, fuck yourself. Uh, but then at the end, he shows up, and when Bruce Willis drops him off, and they come running out, they're completely different characters. We love you. We've missed you. We're worried. We were so worried. Like, they're not even the same characters that they were in the reality of the movie to begin with. It's just, it's so fucking dumb. And this little brat-ass kid. Everybody loves me. Everybody pays attention to me, but my parents. Yeah, fuck you. What is this? Fuck off. Oh, I hate it so much. I am right there with Roger Ebert. I mean, this is one of the worst movies we've ever done. Um, yes. You know, I guess. So, hey, we're like Siskel and Ebert as well. <laughs> I hate that you love Benji the Hunted, Adam. You son of a bitch. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> it's just. I. I just don't know who this was for. Yeah, I think those sound like final thoughts, Adam, because you're kind of this flabbergasted at this point. I don't blame you, necessarily. Um, unless you have anything else to add. <laughs> I'm guessing not. No, just straight up fuck this thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think the only, like, the final thought I want to just portray is, like, with that Roger Ebert review, I would recommend reading that whole review because it does such a great job of, like, doing what you also would, like, love out of, like, a Roger Ebert or any great critic that you really enjoy is someone expressing, you know, like, either an opinion that, like, you find interesting or if it's one that you agree with, and especially it's about a movie that you also hated, just finding someone who can beautifully express it in such a well-written way. Like, that whole I hated this thing. Apparently, like he said many times, that like, that was a thing where, like, he was trying to write, a, like, a regular review about this movie, and then he paused at his typewriter, and he was just, like, full of that hatred, that he just, like, he just wrote out just as, like, a word vomit thing, that whole thing I quoted, and then he's like, no, I think we need to have this in here, and <laughs> it expresses my feelings perfectly, and yeah, I, you, you love having that kind of moment where, you, like, you read somebody criticize a movie, and it's like, I couldn't have expressed it more beautifully than that, just, I hated, hated, hated this movie, 100% agree, man. North fucking sucks. And, you know, honestly, like, just a little postscript here at the end about North. Um, we were talking about John Lovitz in this. Uh, instead of watching North, uh, go watch The Critic, which was a show that he was the main voice of, uh, in which he played, like, a movie critic named Jay Sherman. Particularly, there was an episode in which Siskel and Ebert played themselves. That's very fun. Yeah, go watch The Critic. But now let's get into our weekly segment, The Double Redo. Double redo, double redo, 
double redo, double redo, double double redo, double 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 redo. redo. So the Double Redo is our weekly segment in which Adam and I talk about a good and a bad movie related to the topic in question. Um, so we, uh, you know, bring up sort of like a, a recommendation as it were, like, hey, you should see this movie that fits the topic and you should avoid this one that also fits the topic. So we have that for um, the Roger Ebert's most hated, most beloved movies. And uh, Adam, you're going first here. So uh, what are your picks for the Double Redo this week? Oh, okay, so uh, my picks, I have one documentary and one comedy. Uh, the documentary I have is the one Crumb, about uh, R. Crumb, who did a lot of like underground art and comic books, a lot of it real controversial, uh, sort of perverted, chauvinistic, all that stuff. And it's the story about sort of him and his life. It, it's gross, it's dirty, but it's also like a really interesting look at this sort of really weird awkward guy like you get to meet his family and stuff and it's just this sort of family of just oddballs and just people that are just you might cross the street to get away from or not want to have a conversation with them but sort of how he took all of that social weirdness of himself and his sort of fetishes and things like that and just put it on the paper and became like a big deal in the world of the comics industry like i i think i even own an issue or two of work he's done and they were not cheap when i got them and uh people have seen his you know his other sort of non-controversial work like the keep on trucking guy with you know taking the long stride steps you know that was our crumb like he's just sort of this interesting figure and it's a really good documentary about this fucking weirdo man and i i'm not trying to be insulting but watch the thing and you I'd be hard pressed to find somebody who doesn't agree. Uh, it's just, it's a really, really good documentary. I, I'm a sucker for a good documentary, especially about sort of off kilter people. And I'm a comic book fan. And all. So it's just, it was right up my alley. And uh, yeah, it's pretty fucking great. And then on the flip side, I have uh, probably one of my least favorite. Uh, movies featuring Paula Shore, which is to say, you know, rank them from shit to, you know, pee pee. Um, <laughs> and I have In the Army Now. Uh, it's the one with him and the equally, if probably more problematic, Andy Dick, where they join the army to get some money together to open up their own stereo store. And in it, they get joined up with this other group of sort of Motley Crue characters, David Allen Greer, Lori Petty, and all this shit, and they end up actually having to be in the they're in the desert and war breaks out and sort of them having to get back to base and but uh, and it's just so unfunny. And just take something, you know, that was really happening sort of at the time with the desert storm and all that stuff and sort of making a joke out of it. And it's just ultimately insulting. Uh and again, much like North uh, there's no likable characters in it. It's just sort of grating and annoying. And uh, I'm just, for one, am glad that sort of Pauly Shore and Andy Dick do not have a career uh, anymore, especially Andy Dick. He's a real piece of shit monster. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's garbage. It's absolute garbage. Uh, yeah, I have not seen In the Army now. Um, though I should mention, I'm going to have quotes here from Ebert's reviews of all four of our choices, and this is his quote about In the Army now from his review. Quote, maybe the point of the Polly Shore character is that he's cool and unengaged most of the time. Bombs explode all around him, but he's laid back and doesn't let anyone get to him. Instead of laughs, we get to see him having a good time. Lost in the desert. He has lines like, we are the feud, the proud, the water boys. As they slog through the sand, a vulture follows them. And eventually I began to identify with that vulture, which seemed to be hanging around in case anyone thought of any vulture jokes. That sound accurate? <laughs> yeah, it's spot on. <laughs> and then uh, with uh, Crumb, I have seen Crumb, and I do agree with you, it's amazing. That's, in fact, a movie I would not be really aware of if not for Roger Ebert. That was my introduction to who our Crumb really was, and, like, all the stuff with, like, Fritz the Cat and all the various different, like, the Keep on Trucking and all that stuff. And um, it's an amazing documentary, I agree. It really gives you a full sort of scope about him, especially, like, his upbringing and stuff. And this is, 
Ebert's quote about Crumb, where he says, quote, uh, people who have been damaged by life can take the most amazing adjustments in order to survive and find peace. Sometimes it's a toss up whether to call them mad or courageous. Consider the case of R. Crumb. He was the famous artist in the 60s whose images like Keep on Truckin' and Fritz the Cat and his cover of the 60s album Cheap Thrills helped to fix the visual look of the decade. He was also a person hanging on to Sandy by his fingernails, and it is apparently true that his art saved his life. I think it's a great description. But now, uh, for my two picks, uh, I have uh, my good pick is a Western, and my bad pick is also a comedy, also action-y, sort of to some degree. Um, my good pick uh, is The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance, the 1962 John Ford Western, which older Westerns aren't necessarily my favorite sort of uh, stuff. It's also not a genre, admittingly, I've perused a lot necessarily. Um, but I did watch The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. It's sort of like I was going through a couple of Ebert's great movies uh, recently in prep for the show, trying to find, like, okay, what's one that I could recommend? And this was my favorite of those. And if you're unaware, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance stars Jimmy Stewart uh, as this guy who we're initially introduced to as, like, a senator who's come to this old town for the funeral of a friend. And uh, he regales us with a story of how, in the past, he came to this town after he was... Uh, robbed at gunpoint by the titular Liberty Valance, our villain, who's played by Lee Marvin, and uh, he was robbed of everything, and so he ends up in this little town that we saw at the beginning, and he is, you know, trying to just, like, kind of make some money so he can get out of here, but he ends up to kind of grow fond of the town and all of its inhabitants, including uh, this one character played by John Wayne, um, who uh, is sort of like the beloved town icon who especially has a thing for um, the female love interest in the movie who at the same time is falling for Jimmy Stewart. So there's a bit of a love triangle there, but at the same time, this town is completely under the ruling thumb of Liberty Valance and all his awful cronies, one of which is played uh, by Lee Van Cleef. Um, and I think it's an amazing Western at this particular time where it's shot in black and white. It looks gorgeous, but it's gets you so immersed in, like, this little town, despite the fact that it's, like, shot on, you know, sound stages or whatever. You feel invested in, like, every single person of this little town. All these different side characters, like the newspaper guy, who's played by Edmund O'Brien. Amazing performance. I love that guy. And just a, a bunch of other, like, great people who pop up. Like, John Carradine pops up near the end of the movie. There's like, a bunch of great old-school, like, character actors from that period. And uh, just to quote Ebert's take on this from his review, uh, quote, There is a purity to the style of John Ford. Uh, his composition is classical. He arranges his characters within the frame to reflect power dynamics or sometimes to suggest a balance is changing. Um, his magnificent Western landscapes are always there, but as an environment, not as travelogue. His films mostly are shot on sets, but we're not particularly aware. In a film where, with Lee Marvin's snarl, Andy Devine's squeaky voice, and the accent of the Swedes, John Wayne, as usual, provides the calm center, never trying for an affect. And uh, I completely agree, especially with that. This is probably my favorite of, like, the John Wayne's performances I've seen, where he has that kind of, like, typical movie star charisma that he sort of had. But at the same time, there's a bit more vulnerability and tragedy to him. It's like this and, like, The Searchers, another John Ford movie. I, I kind of like those, like, more deconstructionist Western kind of things, and these kind of fit that bill perfectly, particularly Liberty Battles. I think it's amazing at that. And then my bad pick is Rush Hour 2. Now, interesting fact about me with the Rush Hour movies, before this week I'd only seen the third one, and not of my own volition. Uh, basically, at the time when it was out in theaters, I was uh, not 18. I was trying to sneak into uh, Halloween, the Rob Zombie remake, and I couldn't. So I had to begrudgingly see Rush Hour 3, because I had bought the ticket for that, trying to sneak into Halloween. Didn't work out for me, especially because uh, Rush Hour 3 is very terrible. But uh, because it was so bad, I never watched the other two, and not helped by Brett Ratner directed all three of those movies, and fuck that guy. Awful piece of shit person. Um, but this week I was like, you know what, okay, fine, I'll... I'm curious to at least, because Roger Ebert really hated Rush Hour 2, so I'm like, I guess this is a good excuse to you to watch the other two movies in that trilogy, um, especially since I wasn't didn't have to pay for anything because of Adam's voodoo account. Thank you, Adam, for that. Uh, so I didn't have to support uh, fucking Brett Radner or anything like that. But um, with the Rush Hour movies, it, it's fascinating, where I think the first one is like a solid like 90s era like action comedy movie. It's fine. Chris Tucker and Jackie Chan are pretty solid together. There's some fun Jackie Chan stunts. Tucker has a few fun lines. It's like, it's a totally watchable. I get why it was successful. And then Rush Hour 2 um, is not, like I said, as bad as Rush Hour 3, but is a very painful experience. I think just the comedy all around is so much more like sort of insulting and more based on a lot of the stereotype stuff like we we're kind of talking about with North, um, especially a lot of like sexual harassment stuff. 
that felt like, oh, we're trying to be funny about this, and feels very eye-opening, especially considering uh, Brett Ratner and later revelations about him. It feels very overbloated, and it feels like they're kind of going through a lot of the motions of the first movie, but just, like, bigger and much more insulting. Like, there's a couple decent action bits with Chan... I'm um, doing some stunt stuff, but they also really overhyped like all the Chris Tucker stuff to a degree that I'm like, you know what? I'm glad you only made like five fucking movies over the past 20 years, dude, because <laughs> I could not take multiple vehicles like this for you. And Roger Ebert was really not a fan of Tucker in particular uh, when he was writing his review. Uh, he said at one point, this is uh, his sort of final part of the review and talking about Latcher bashing Tucker the entire review, basically saying he really sinks the movie. Uh, quote, one rule all comedians should know and some have to learn the hard way is that they aren't funny. It's the material that gets the laughs. Another rule is that if you're the top dog on a movie set, everybody is going to pretend to laugh at everything you do. So anyone who tells you it's not that funny is trying to do you a favor. And uh, harsh, but um, based on this movie, I don't blame him because uh, it's a really, really unfunny turn from Tucker and just a really, just generally unexciting and interesting summer action comedy movie in general. Uh, yeah, I've seen both your movies. Completely agree on Rush Hour 2. Uh, I still think, yeah, Rush Hour is fun. I liked it more when it first came out. Uh, I've seen it recently. It's okay. It's fine. Like, it's it's pretty harmless. Uh, the second one goes full bore into the sort of Asian stereotypes and especially the sexual stuff. Some of which was in the first movie, but they ramp it up way more. They, yeah, they take it to 11. Like, where the first one, it's like, you know, Jack Chan's sort of a fish out of out of water in LA and blah, 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 blah. People aren't used to him. And the second one, it's, you know, just Chris Tucker. It's, just, it's bad. It's just, it's really bad. It's just because he's in Hong Kong. He's surrounded by people he can make racial stereotypes about. Exactly. And then Man of Shot Liberty Valance, uh, I really do enjoy. Uh, I think Man of Shot Liberty Valance has some of the best use of sort of flashbacks to tell a story. In film history, I think it's just perfectly executed. So yeah, I absolutely agree with you on that one. I, I think if you're going to watch a John Ford movie, that's one of the best ones. Yeah, I really, really do love uh, Liberty Balance, for sure. Um, and yeah, let's uh, repeat our titles for everybody out there, um, in case you know want to add something to your watch list or you want to avoid them, Adam. I had Crumb and In the Army Now. And for me, I had uh, my good pick of The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance, and for my bad pick, I had Rush Hour 2. And now we're going to be exiting the show here, so uh, stay tuned uh, as we get to do our picking for next week at the very end of this. Uh, but first, got to thank some people, like Chris Oliver for the intro and outro music used in our show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Uh, thanks to Christian Thor Lally for our artwork. Uh, follow him at Night of Water, that's night with a K, underscore of, underscore water, for all of his great stuff on various socials. And thanks, of course, to our Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash dedbpod, where for just $1 a month, you get access to a bonus podcast we record at least one a month, including uh, by the end of April, we'll be having our top 10 So Bad They're Good movies as our bonus episode. It'll be a lot of fun to record that. And then also polls where you get to pick, you know, certain movies or topics that we cover. Uh, stay tuned. Our picking will involve that in a bit uh, for next week's episode. Um, so yeah, just for the one dollar, you get access to all that kind of stuff and help support the show. Really keeps, you know, the lights going on and all this other stuff for the program. And uh, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at DEDBpod. And you can also email us feedback uh, double edge, double bill at gmail.com. All spelled out. And for me specifically, I'm on Twitter and Letterboxd, satin out the Who's Tommy. I also do some writing on marianithomas.wordpress.com and at film-cred.com. And you can find me on Instagram at atom or adam, that's A-T-O-M underscore O-R underscore A-D-A-M, or on Letterboxd at schwanson, S-C-H-W-A-N-D-T-S-O-N. And uh, you can follow us on various different uh, platforms like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or other places wherever you get your podcasts out there. If you're listening on Talk Film Society, you want to listen to all the other great shows here on the network. But uh, you can also dig into our archives and our Podbean main feed for like around 200 episodes or so before we joined TFS. And nothing else, if you can't you know, support us on the Patreon, that $1 a month can be a lot for some people, we totally understand. But the free way to help us out is to rate, review, or simply share the show around and give us more visibility. Basically give us the thumbs ups out there, as it were. Yeah, not hard. Very easy. Come on. You can do it with your thumb. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Wow. How meta of you. Yeah, true. 
Yeah, meta, that's what that is, not a reference. Yeah, anyway, uh, yeah. now, <laughs> let's just get into uh, our picking for next week, Adam, because as I mentioned, at the end of every episode, Adam and I each, uh, you know, like to have two picks, uh, either two good or two bad picks, which we switch up on the quality usually for that, and we assign them between one and ten for both those choices, and uh, the other person will pick, say, like, oh, I'm going to pick number seven, and the other person will say, okay, that is closest to number eight, which is this particular movie that usually gets us our good and our bad pick. Uh, but keep in mind some things. Uh, one, because of some delays we had in a couple episodes ago, uh, we're not switching off on the quality for this, uh, mainly because, two, uh, our patrons end up picking from Adam's good choices for next week. Uh, so we're going to be going with that one. Uh, for Monster Moms is our topic, which is in honor of Evil Dead Rises coming out. So basically sort of like horror, thriller sort of movies that have sort of a, a, an antagonist that's a mother character to kind of fit that. And uh, Adam, the patrons end up picking between your two choices, uh, which were Hereditary and then the ultimate winner of John Waters' Serial Mom, which I'm very excited to cover. Yeah, me too. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I remember it being fun. Yeah, for sure. Well, I can't wait to talk about that next time. But Adam, I've got my two bad picks, so please pick them okay. one in ten for my bad choices. All right. Ah, uh, let's go number seven. Okay. At number six, I had a movie here um, that we've both actually seen together, and I think it's a fascinating, weird movie with a sort of a, a surrogate mother type character. Uh, she's the titular mother, or should I say, Ma, starring Octavia mm-hmm. Spencer. Yeah, man. I, I, I think I like Ma. I don't know, though. It's one of those. It's, 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 it makes some choices. We'll, we'll talk about it. There are a lot of fascinating choices with Ma that we'll be talking about. Uh, it's, it's fascinating either way. Um, and then, on the other side of things, over at number one, um, I had a movie that it recently got remade to no sort of press or whatever, starring Naomi Watts. But um, I'm talking about the original movie, which I was not a fan of. A lot of people liked it. I never got quite the hype of it. I had uh, the original Goodnight Mommy, which I think is a vastly overrated horror movie, quite frankly. Vastly overrated. Okay, we're on the same page with this. Yeah, I don't, I don't get all the love that movie had at all. Bro. I don't either. I think it's boring and so predictable as well. Yeah, for sure on that. Um, but yeah, so Serial Mom and Ma. Next time. Uh, but until then, everybody, the balcony is closed. See what I did there? I, I kind of like equated us to the subject. That's a reference there. Yeah, yeah. How meta. <laughs>